Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 13th, 2018, and I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll find a link to our annual survey where you can vote for your favorite episodes of the year and tell us about yourself and your listening experience. And now for today's guest, economics professor Jennifer Doliak of Texas A&M University, where she is the director of the Justice Tech Lab. She has done extensive research on issues related to crime, which is our topic for today. Jennifer, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. The homepage of the Justice Tech Lab, uh, which you're the director of, says, technology is transforming the criminal justice system. Let's make sure it's for the better. I want to take one, each of those at, the, at one at a time. Uh, technology is transforming the criminal justice system. In what ways? What are some of the ways that's happening? So, yeah, there are a lot of ways. So um, I think, you know, people probably watch shows like CSI and imagine all the, the super high tech um, potential advances that that could be uh, making police investigations better um, or, or just making um, uh, crime fighting more efficient. Uh, a lot of those those you know, TV depictions of, of how um, technology is, is affecting things aren't entirely accurate, but there are there have been a lot of advances in recent decades and we don't fully understand them. So if you think about things like um, just having cameras everywhere, there, I think we're kind of used to or almost expect that there will be surveillance cameras uh, in most public places now. Um, GPS monitors for people who are, uh, you know, on probation or um, have been have been arrested and waiting for their trial. Um, DNA databases, um, just a, a whole a whole bunch of things that that have been um, that are all relatively new advances and that can can make our crime fighting more efficient. And what are the worries about those technologies being used? Um, poorly. Why, why do you have the tagline, let's make sure it's for the better? Because <laughs> uh, we would hope, uh, naively, of course, but we would hope that, of course, adding technology would make it better, but it doesn't always. Right. It doesn't always. And, and for some of the same reasons that all government programs don't always do what we hope they will do, right? I mean, it's just hard to, it's, it's often hard to predict how, um, Every all the players will adapt to the implementation of a new technology, um, and so so measuring those effects in the real world to make sure we're actually getting the benefits that we hope that we will, I think, is important. Uh, but then, in addition, a lot of these uh, these tools have substantial costs. Um, you know, partly financial costs. I mean, these are just really expensive, and we could imagine spending our money in more productive ways if if they're not that useful. Uh, but but a lot of the the tools are really at their core surveillance tools, and um, and they could make policing and crime fighting more efficient and productive by increasing the likelihood that you get caught for your crime, which means at its core, they're keep, it's keeping better tabs on everybody. Um, and so that has privacy costs. Um, and those privacy costs are extremely difficult to quantify, right? That's something I still haven't figured out a good way to, <laughs> to measure what those costs would be. But, um, but I think people like me, economists, can, um, can add to the conversation by at least calculating what the benefits are so that we can have a more informed conversation about whether they're worth any potential costs. Yeah, my view on that, and we'll talk some more about this later, but my view on that is that economics has something to contribute in measuring costs and benefits, but there are certain things that are inherently – they're not unquantifiable, but they're not easily quantified. And mm -hmm. we're going to have to make a trade off then between, say, the financial costs and benefits and some other costs and benefits, unless you're a, a utilitarian. I'm not. I think that's – in fact, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come and talk more about that later, but I think that's the issue – and exactly as you say, you don't know how to quantify privacy loss. Uh, I don't think that's what he, economics isn't particularly good at it. Uh, you, uh -huh. you get a good paper out of it potentially if you can <laughs> make a stab <laughs> at it, but I'm not sure it'll be sure. um, 
very, very accurate. One thing you did not mention in your list of technology was artificial intelligence. And mm-hmm. we had Catherine O'Neill on the program quite a while back, and she voiced concerns that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are being creatively used in the criminal justice system without full regard for what their impact might be. Do you think that's mm-hmm. correct? Um, yes, with some caveats. I think uh, so. I think that a lot of people are thinking very deeply about this. Um, I actually have some ongoing work with Megan Stevenson, uh, who's an economist at George Mason Law, looking at the impact of risk assessment in sentencing. And and a lot of the, um, you know, risk assessment as implemented in a lot of places is not a fancy machine learning tool. It's, you know, a checklist and you add up the points, but it's based on a regression uh, based on existing data that kind of comes up with with a prediction um, of your likelihood of reoffending. And then they apply the, the coefficients from that regression to come up with, with a risk score for future defendants. Um, and part of the reason we're interested in this question and studying it is that we think, uh, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing on, on both sides about the potential of this type of technology and this type of innovation and application in criminal justice, but a whole lot of other contexts too. Um, and one potential downside, one reason that they might make things worse is that you could imagine them sort of baking in existing biases uh, or, or doing a really good job of, of predicting the biased behavior that is, that is currently exhibited and then sort of like baking it in and, and uh, you know, uh, accompanying it with sort of a veneer of science that gives it more credibility than it might have in the current court room. Um, At the same time, there's tremendous potential where we know, like, so my, the way I push back on, on those concerns is usually it, we don't have to come up with a tool that's perfect. We just have to come up with a tool that's better than the status quo. Right. And so if, if what these machine learning algorithms or any algorithms are doing is removing some of the bias that we know exists in the current system. Police officers operating based on their hunches. Um, you know, they don't like the way that that guy looks. He seems suspicious. A judge, you know, his football team lost this weekend. And so now he's in a bad mood and the, the kid in front of him gets a long sentence. If we can get rid of those biases, then we could be moved in a much more, uh, we could be moved in the right direction, even if we're not, even if we don't wind up where we want to be in the end. It's kind of a perfect example of um, all that's wonderful about social science and all that's horrific for me. Uh, I'm, being more, I'm more of a skeptic of about empirical work than most economists. And you know, I, I look at that and I think it, the average person – excuse me, the average economist will say it's better than nothing because the mm-hmm. judge just has, say, a gut instinct, as you say, or a hunch or worse is – affected by some life event that is way outside the life of this poor person standing before the judge. Mm-hmm. And yet, as you say, the challenge is if you're not careful, you'll over convince yourself that you've done something scientific that that is actually not and is merely what, what I had called scientism. It looks like science, but it's not really science. Mm-hmm. And I, For me, it, it's very similar to the example we just talked about on costs and benefits. It's, it's, it's a useful tool. It, it would be good for a judge to be aware of that analysis. I just would never want it to be the determinant by itself. Mm-hmm. Well, and and in practice, it isn't the tool, uh, the determinant itself, right? And that's actually, in some ways, part of the problem. I think. <laughs> so, so one of the reasons that that Megan and I think this is an interesting topic for for economists to study in particular is that what we, what we really want to know is when this tool is implemented, what are the out, what are the impacts on things like recidivism or um, or racial disparities in in sentencing? Um, do we get, do would we have the sense that this is making our decisions more accurate or more efficient or better for society in some way? Kind of beyond how it's I mean, the challenge here, right? Is that we never know in an individual case what the right answer was, whether the person was actually sure. guilty or innocent or what the, the optimal sentence should be in a particular case. And so, so we want to know, like, when you, when you consider all of these potential uh, pros and cons of this, of this policy and, and how it's implemented in practice through the judge, right, the judge is going to kind of look at the score in addition to everything else they're looking at. How does that affect 
they're, you know, and then they've got a whole bunch of incentives that they're weighing. And so, um, so how does this affect their decisions in the end? That's ultimately going to have an impact on social outcomes that we care about. And so what economists can do, can contribute here is, is measuring what the impacts are on those ultimate outcomes rather than getting really bogged down in the details of whether the algorithm is accurate. It reminds me a little bit of, of the, um, Attempts we have – we've made in the past as economists to measure the impact of schooling on wages, various other outcomes, but typically wages, some mm-hmm. form of, of income. And you know, at some point, somebody realized that years of schooling is not a really precise variable, uh, that, mm-hmm. that for some schools were awful. And a year of having your rear end in the seat is not necessarily the accumulation of human capital – that occurs at a different universe, different school or different university. Depends sure. on what you major in. It, it depends what you do, your grade point, a thousand things. And yet we we spent an enormous amount of effort trying to measure, quote, the return to a year of schooling, whatever, mm. with, with all mm-hmm. the flaws that that means. And I wonder, I'd like to get your thoughts on what a year in prison means. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, what we ultimately – well, we care about a lot of that. I was going to say, say what we care about. We care about a lot of things. Different people <laughs> care about different things. One of the things I would care about, and it would be an important thing for me, would be the uh, post-prison life of a prisoner and whether mm-hmm. prison uh, reduced the chances of that person uh, committing future crime. And equally mm-hmm. important to me would be whether their life outside of prison can be a life of some – potential and flourishing, or whether that prison sentence has a lifelong effect that's destructive, way beyond mm-hmm. the physical time spent behind bars. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree that this is a, um, a really important question, and it is definitely the research frontier in, in economics research. I think, um, so, so there are a lot of uh, things to consider here. As you note, that there, there are a lot of uh, um, factors that that judges weigh that we as citizens consider in ter- in terms when we're thinking about what the the right sentence is for somebody but i think economists in particular take a view that you know if we we if we want to allocate incarceration efficiently we want to uh we're most focused on what the impact of incarcerating someone is on um on kind of social costs and benefits and that would include any sort of rehabilitation effect on the individual who's being incarcerated. And ideally, we would love to move to a, a, a world, I think, where um, where we can implement programs and policies that uh, that really transform the person's life for the better, or give them the best chance to, um, to have a good life when they get out. Uh, and that might mean, you know, very short sentences, but a whole lot more investment in mental health programs and substance abuse treatment and education and all those things. Um, so, in terms of the research that we that we have, there's been some good research now. Um, so the challenge is that we don't have great data on any of this. In the United States, we don't. Uh, if you think about our big surveys like the census, we don't have a question on that about whether you have a criminal record, right? And so it's really hard actually to um, to get the data that you need to be able to study these questions, um, to link pe- to look at the population that has a criminal record or is incarcerated, link that data with what their educational outcomes are, what their employment outcomes are down the road, if they get married, if they have kids, what the kids are doing. Uh, this is all, all the stuff that researchers are currently working to link those kind of data sets in the United States. Um, in Scandinavian countries, it happens a lot more often. So a lot of our best evidence comes from that context, but it's probably not... Um, uh, it's it's unclear how how relevant <laughs> the, yeah. the Scandinavian experience of prison is to the U.S. So I think in the U.S., like the, you know, Mike Mueller Smith at Michigan has a nice paper showing that for people who are on the margin of incarceration, so if you uh, get random randomly assigned to one courtroom, you have a judge who's really harsh. If you're randomly assigned to another courtroom, you have a judge who's really lenient. Uh, that's essentially equivalent to being randomized to incarceration or not. Um, and so if you are unlucky and have the harsh judge, you're more likely to be sentenced. Um, and for people in that situation who are really on the margin of being incarcerated, where it really comes down to which judge you saw, um, incarceration harms their outcomes. Um, so employment decreases, um, is it to look at a bunch of different um, effects on social services and so on. So in general, it really does seem, seems like on the margin of the United States, the punchline here is that we're incarcerating too many people, right? That's the, 
we could we could scale it back a little bit. Um, that said, we've got other evidence on, you know, we've kind of similar effects uh, for juveniles. Um, Azer and Doyle have a paper showing, again, detrimental effects for juvenile incarceration. But there was a more recent paper that looked at juvenile incarceration in Louisiana and found that actually the marginal kids who were sentenced and incarcerated are better off um, than the kids who aren't. Uh, and so it really does come down to the context, what the programs are in the prison, what the outside options are, what's the alternative for the kids who wouldn't, who or, or adults who um, who aren't incarcerated anymore. Um, and I think we're just beginning to have kind of enough studies on this um, that are really good at identifying um, this causal effect to be able to start thinking about how much the estimates are differ across different contexts and, and starting to think about what, what can explain that. Do you have any thoughts on this issue of a year in prison? Obviously, certain prisons have different mm-hmm. characteristics. We did an episode mm-hmm. with David Scarbeck that I found very thought-provoking on mm-hmm. the norms that emerge within prisons for how prisoners treat each other. But along the way in that book, he highlighted how uh, street crime culture extends into the prison and then back out again. That you know we mm-hmm. have a certain – I think the average non-criminal, which I think is me. I've never been in, in prison. Um, has a weird and unrepresentative uh, view of prison life that comes from TV and movies, um, mm-hmm. mostly uh, well, overwhelmingly from those two. And of course, some of them may be accurate. I assume most of them are not. Uh, <laughs> but do you think there's a lot of variety in what a year in prison means, depending on what prison you're in? Forget the judge and the length of the sentence, mm-hmm. but a, mm-hmm. a three-year sentence of, of one place must be be different than a three-year sentence somewhere else? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think especially um, a lot of programming winds up being tied to um, you know, local community services and people come in and, and volunteer and you know do tutoring and hold yoga classes and all that kind of stuff. And that's going to really depend on the local environment. Certainly, so criminal justice policy in the United States is primarily state and local. Um, and so uh, it's that's a huge benefit for, <laughs> for researchers like myself because it means there's a lot of variety and a whole bunch of different dimensions. It also means that you're not dependent on the federal government <laughs> for a lot of different policy changes. Um, and so when changes happen, it, it usually is up to state and local officials. Um, so that definitely means that there's a lot of variety um, across the United States. But I think it's also um, to kind of think of about what the impact of a year in prison is in different contexts. One of the most uh, striking examples is there was a, a nice, uh, speaking of Scandinavian countries, a nice paper a couple of years ago finding that for uh, people who are sent to prison in Norway, uh, they are much better off when they get out. It's essentially going to like a you know job training camp for a year or two and um, you get all these incredible services and you come out a much better person, much more uh, ready to take on the world. And... Um, you know, it's a great paper, but it is it 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 says more, I think, about the potential of prison than um, than anything that we have in the United States right now. Well, we just need to send our prisoners to Norway, right? Exactly. They've that's, obviously figured that's the it out. Policy we should lesson. export. <laughs> we should outsource to Norway. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk about a particular study of yours on uh, body worn cameras, which is a awkward phrase, but it means police wandering around. I assume videoing their every move. Mm -hmm. Um, First, tell us how widespread that is. And is it every move? Is it when when are they allowed to turn them on and off? Some places it's mandatory. Some places I assume it's maybe voluntary. I don't know. But tell me about that landscape. Tell us about that landscape. And then uh, what what are some of the effects of of that technology, which I think most of us would assume that's a good thing. It's it adds Mm -hmm. to transparency. Uh, So it it, it must be good. Talk about – so talk about the landscape of usage of the technology and then what you found when you studied it. Yeah, and just to clarify, so I I haven't – I actually have a couple ongoing projects on body-worn cameras, but I I think the study you're referring to is by the lab at DC um, in Washington, D.C. I was not an author on that study, so uh, but I've written about this. (laughs) Yeah, I think you maybe blogged on it. I thought it was your I blogged on it, right. Yes, so I've paid attention to this literature. So so body-worn cameras are – uh, at this point, increasingly common, and the the hope. So it, it depends on local rules um, and guidelines uh, when officers are required to turn the camera off and on. 
different places have different uh, different standards for that. Some places it's voluntary. It's kind of entirely up to the officer discretion. Other places, like as soon as you get out of your car, you need to have it on. Um, part of the challenge in, you know, I think the reason that it's not the default that it would be on all the time uh, is partly just financial. It's the storage costs for all the video that that racks up um, get to be pretty high. Um, but you, it's also, uh, I think, a reasonable um, uh, reaction to the knowledge that a lot of the interactions that police have with citizens over the course of the day are during the worst moments of those those people's lives, and they don't necessarily want that recorded. Yeah. Um, think about kind of domestic um, violence situations or someone who's having a mental break of some sort. Um, there, there might be times when you might want to turn the camera off. Um, but that also, so that's kind of just, just in terms of whether the camera's on or off, but then there are also policies about when the footage is available. Uh, is it public record, right? Does, does any citizen have the, the right to go in and ask for the camera footage from Officer Jones from the past year? Um, and again, there are very strict guidelines um, and, and differences across different jurisdictions about what's available and what isn't. Um, and all of this is, the goal here is to increase transparency and accountability for police. Um, we, uh, we've been having a, a lot of very uh, difficult but important conversations in this country over the last couple of years about um, unnecessary use of force by officers and, um, and the extent to which that, that force is disproportionately used against African Americans and, um, and a lot of, there have been a lot of viral videos going around, usually caught by cell phone videos, uh, not body worn cameras. Um, showing officers using force when it seemed very clear that they should not be. Uh, and so this has prompted, I think, a lot of, certainly a lot of discussion about what can be done about this. How should we reform, um, you know, the rules governing police behavior or training or, you know, what else to try to reduce the number of these incidents? Um, and, and one potential uh, solution is to have these officers wear cameras all the time. Um, so that we can see for ourselves in any interaction whether you know whether the facts were on their side or the the, the person that they were interacting with side. Um, my take on this is you know this has become so popular because we don't know what else to do. Uh, we don't <laughs> we don't have any better ideas. And this seemed there was one study from Rialto, California, several years ago that showed that. Um, the the use of body worn cameras uh, in that in that city reduced the number dramatically reduced the number of complaints um, from citizens against the police department and people thought oh good that's a good outcome fewer complaints means that they must be um, doing fewer bad things and so let's just this is the solution to all of our complicated <laughs> societal problems we'll just have all the cameras where these or all these police officers wear cameras uh, and um, of course there are firms that are happy to sell cameras and the data storage that come with it. And they're very, very expensive. Um, but so in terms of what we know, like what, what's been done, there have now been a number of really good randomized control trials looking at the impacts of body worn cameras. The first, uh, the one that, that I think I, I wrote about in that blog post that you saw um, was, I think the first in a major US city, it was in Washington, DC, where they randomly assigned cameras to some officers and not others. Um, and then they waited and, and saw what the impact was on the officer's behavior. Um, and, you know, they had a zillion different potential measures that they could look at um, to get a sense of uh, whether officers' behavior and interactions changed in any way <laughs> after when they were wearing cameras versus when they didn't. Uh, and then the, the end result was that nothing seemed to change. There was just like null results all across the board. Um, this, it turns out, uh, is in line with um, previous studies, more or less. So, so there have been um, other previous studies in the U.S. and in Europe. Some find that, uh, that body-worn cameras increase use of force, actually. Some find that it decreases use of force. Uh, on average, there's no effect. Um, in the DC context, my hunch is that most of those officers just assume they were on camera all the time anyway, because it's Washington DC and there are cameras everywhere. <laughs> and so, so that seems like an easy way to explain why there's no effect in DC. But, uh, yeah, the punchline here is that, um, you know, policies that we implement for good reason don't 
necessarily have the impacts we think they will have. And it then becomes a critical that we under, that we we go in with particular goals in mind so that we can sort of be honest with ourselves about whether it's working. What do you think we would expect those cameras to do? I mean, I think the average person's first thought um, is that, well, if you know you're on camera, you know, the, the joke, it's not a joke. The saying is, is that uh, morality is about how you behave when no one's watching. Mm-hmm. So, the idea of a body worn camera is that someone's always watching. Right. Uh, of course, there was always somebody watching before. There was the person you're interacting with. There's the your colleagues, often your fellow officers, police officers. Mm-hmm. So it, it it's a little more complicated. But you'd think it would add to uh, a feeling of of being responsible, and it would reduce the worst kinds of uh, reactions in those kinds of high stress situations. And I guess mm-hmm. my my that's that's the first thing. But it's not the end, of course. There's the mm-hmm. then classic economics question. And then what? How does right. it change the behavior <laughs> of 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 potential uh victims, uh criminals, uh you name it. Mm-hmm. And and then how does it change where the police go and <laughs> how they spend their time? I mean, if you mm-hmm. know you're on camera, uh you might avoid certain places that uh or settings that you thought might lead to s- stress and and putting yourself in an awkward situation being recorded. So those mm-hmm. are the things I think economists look at. If, and if I've uh, if I've left uh, left any off, I'd like I'd love your reaction. But the other last mm-hmm. thought I'd have is that you know, as in many ways, uh, one unnecessary death uh, because an officer overreacted is one too many. Mm-hmm. So on the other hand. Uh, there aren't very many of these. So right. there are a lot, horrifyingly, for the people whose lives are lost and their families and mm-hmm. loved ones. I don't, I'm not minimizing it at all or suggesting it's a, it's a horrible, sure. horrible, horrible thing, and it seems to be on the rise. But my point as an economist is, is that it's a very infrequent event, and it's not likely that the cameras are going to pick those up. And so in any mm-hmm. one study, we might see no effect, but that's just because – it's rare, and what the camera does is reduce the odds of a rare, horrifying event, and so they're really important, mm-hmm. even though in the sample period, quote, no effect. So, what do you what do you think of those, uh, yeah. those arguments? Absolutely, yeah. No, so the um, I think the, just to, to start, I think the one thing I would add to your list about potential behavioral effects here, um, the one reason we might expect that these cameras would inc- actually increase use of force is you could imagine that most officers try very hard all the time not to make the front page of the newspaper, right? And like when in doubt, when they think there might be any question, they back off. And you could imagine that when they're wearing a camera and it would be clear to anyone watching the video that the facts were on their side, then they might use force more often. And so that might be how you you get this kind of um, policy to backfire. But yeah, your point about the the rare events here, uh, I think is, is, crucial to, to interpreting these studies. Um, you know, I think when, when DC's results came out, the, it was, I think somewhat frustrating to the people who ran the study because the, the city then said, well, even though there are no results, um, and we said that that was what we cared about, uh, we're going to keep the cameras anyway. (laughs) And, and I think you then have to think to your, you then have to ask yourself, well, like, well, what do you really care about then? Because like, you, you know, you told us these were the outcomes you care about and, uh, and, and, you know, the city officials were certainly not the only ones who, who went down this road and, and basically saying, well, what we really care about is just the, the possibility that we could find out if when, when one of these terrible situations happens and, and someone dies and we, we are suspicious about the circumstances, we want to be able to go look at the footage. And that is a completely reasonable, uh, goal and a completely reasonable thing to pay a lot of money for, um, but it will never be picked up in an RCT, right? Like these studies- Randomized, never, randomized never, control trial. Randomized control trial, right? These studies would never have have been able to measure the impacts on, yeah, the one, you know, very rare death or, or being able to quantify in any way kind of what the, um, what the impact is on just sort of community trust of police if it doesn't show up in in day-to-day behavior. And so this is where you really have to, again, just be very clear on what the goals are and make sure that the studies that you're doing are actually informing you about whether those those goals are met or not. 
It's a really interesting example of policy because, you know, when I think about it, I think, I mean, there's obviously some kind of virtue signaling going on here by the politicians saying, hey, look, we're letting you look. So it's it's good. There's mm-hmm. some amount of money that that would cost that would be not worth paying because you could do something better with the money in theory at least. Right. Um, but it also strikes me that given the power of the state to use force and the the risk of, of, of a very tragic outcome at times, which we know happens, that this mm-hmm. just seems like a good idea. I wouldn't say at any cost. Obviously, there mm-hmm. is a cost to be too high, but I think it's worth quite a bit, even if it doesn't show up in the data. The other thing mm-hmm. that strikes me that I, I find s- s- just strange about the nature of life, um, you could imagine a school putting cameras in every classroom to make mm-hmm. sure there isn't an incident where a student is, say, bullied by a teacher, bullied by other students, humiliated, or where a teacher loses it, which, of course, uh, happens even in, in first rate schools. A teacher after mm-hmm. a long day, if there's a student that gets under their skin and they just explode, and that's a horrible thing. It often is very destructive to the teacher, the relationship with the other kids, et cetera. But mm-hmm. it would be a weird thing. Think how weird it would be that you would put in a video camera in every classroom and you would only use it for um, disasters. So it would seem to me yeah. – maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but these cameras, they actually – they're capturing mm-hmm. lots of data, nothing to do with – these tragic encounters with uh, with often innocent people that end in, in terrible tragedy, they're capturing mm-hmm. every day-to-day moment. And there's an enormous opportunity to improve the teaching, the style, the coaching, the, sure. the way that police behave on the job. And I, I, want, I doubt that's happening, or am I wrong? I think I think people are trying. I think it is definitely a, a logistical challenge to think about how to do do this though. Um, my sense is that police departments are using footage in, in training. Um, it's unclear, you know, if that is helping in any way. Uh, but there are, you know, there are researchers who are trying hard to think about, you know, how to study the footage that is, that is captured from all these, you know, zillions of hours (laughs) of police interactions with, with citizens to try to say something useful about, um, you know, what what police behavior or policies or practices um, are beneficial or, you know, whether you could imagine even seeing like if there's a policy change and there's a new training program, does that improve the interactions with people? And and to be able to use the, the footage in any sort of productive way, it's going to require, uh, you know, running it through machine learning algorithms and looking for. So I think people have, you know, people have done this and just listened for the words like please or thank you, like to (laughs) to measure like whether police officers seem polite, right? But that's basically like when you think about what's required and what you'd be trying to train the algorithm to look for and it just gets very complicated and it's hard to think about, you know, to some extent we we kind of know when we see an interaction that is, you know, maybe could have could have been de escalated or something else, but thinking about training an algorithm to detect that seems hard harder. Um, but there are people thinking about it. Certainly, uh, it is not possible in these departments for people to just like watch all of the video, right? Like that is not going to happen because it's just the, the storage cost for the video will fall dramatically as the years progress. The human the, like labor cost of having someone sit there and watch all the hours of footage to see if anything went wrong, um, that is only going to get more expensive. And so that is just not, it's not on the table. I'm just struck by the similarity uh, between being a good police officer and being a good teacher. Uh, Mm -hmm. We often judge teaching based on outcomes, not what happens day to day on the ground. But a good teacher and a good principal or a good um, uh, principal knows who the good teachers are and is often in those classrooms and knows the techniques that work well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Doug Lamov, previous Econ Talk guest, has has. Just he creates all these videos online to help people see how to do these techniques well. And to really pick an unattractive analogy, a lot of what being a good teacher is is keeping order in the classroom. And that's Mm -hmm. an art. It's not something, first of all, most 24 year olds straight out of school or 26 year olds out of grad school don't know how to do it. They learn from Mm -hmm. experience, they learn from other teachers. Uh, I'm sure it's true for police officers too. And I think about the mm-hmm. the work of the great Jane Jacobs and how in 
in older times, police were walking the streets rather than driving in cars and Mm -hmm. had an intimacy and familiarity with the neighborhood and vice versa that must have been, I think, much healthier than the current world. So the idea that somebody comes out of uh, police school uh, ready to be a police officer, there's a thousand things they don't know how to do in various encounters. Mm -hmm. And there's just an art here that it just seems that would be a useful thing to think about. Somebody's got – there's an opportunity there, that's all. (laughs) <laughs> no, I totally agree. And I'll, I'll add to the um, the sort of uh, complicated situation when someone comes straight out of the you know the training training to be a police officer and they're put on the force. And typically, the rookies wind up um, in the worst neighborhoods because there's sort of like as you gain seniority, you get yourself out of yeah. there. Uh, and so that's that uh, is surely not <laughs> the most efficient way to run to run things. But you understand how it how it happens. Um, yeah, same I mean, analogy I that, with students, right? Yeah, you give the new totally. teacher the worst classroom in some schools. That's a terrible thing to Absolutely. do. <laughs> yes, yeah. So I think you know there there is currently some um, uh, active academic research, but I also know that in house police departments are tr- are working very hard to come up with ways to identify the problem officers um, and it, early so that. There can be some sort of intervention uh, yet, you know, yet to be determined what that intervention <laughs> is and whether it has any effect. But, uh, but at least, you know, identifying the problem officers first before they get to a point where um, they've killed somebody. Uh, and and so different. So there there is some active work there. Um, but it definitely this is this is sort of all uh, related to just the black box of policing, which we know much less about than um, you know one one area that I think we've sort of settled in the in the, the economics literature at least is that uh, more police equals less crime. Um, we know from a study after study after study uh, that when you have good causal identification, hiring more police officers reduces crime rates. Um, but that obviously that is on average, right? Uh, and and the best evidence suggests that most American cities are under policed, uh, not over policed. Um, but that is again on average, and certainly we know from all you know all the conversations we've been having the last couple of years, not every officer uh, is a, is doing good things, and not everything that police officers do over the course of the day uh, is beneficial and productive. And so figuring, I think we're just at the point where people are starting to to figure out ways to kind of get inside that black box of how police officers spend their days and the variation across officers um, and, and, you know, try to figure out, you know, we try to say something useful about how we could potentially reform training or reform our, the incentive structure for police officers um, to, to get better outcomes. Yeah, and again, it's the same issue in teaching. You don't really want to mm-hmm. incentivize teachers to be rewarded based on the grades of their students or their test scores. You get all kinds mm-hmm. of perverse effects there. And similarly, this is a big challenge, but it, it's one that I don't think government does very well. Um, it, it's, it struggles to, I would say, to customize the way it treats either employees or situations. So. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's going to get better anytime soon. Let's talk about another. Yeah. Let's talk about another piece of your work, um, uh, your actual work. I think I hope, which <laughs> is on um, DNA databases. Yeah. Um, again, I have no idea how DNA databases work. I assume there's. I, I, I assume I can't get at one. I don't know even. I mean, <laughs> t- so tell us what they right. are. Uh, other than you know, every once in a while you hear, oh, somebody checked into a DNA database and they were freed. But I don't know how mm-hmm. – so tell us how they actually work uh, in, in, a, in a thumbnail and then what you've studied and what you found looking at them. Sure. So uh, so DNA databases in the criminal justice context are um, uh, computer databases, as you might expect, uh, where you basically store identifying profiles of, um, of offenders along with um, the DNA, DNA – DNA profiles from crime scenes, uh, and then occasionally, uh, or on a regular, very regular basis, those databases occasionally are scanned to see to find matches. Um, so to match offend, known offenders with um, with evidence from unsolved crimes. Um, so 
who is required to uh, to be added to the database depends on state law in the United States, um, national law in other countries for the most part. Uh, but these these databases at this point in the criminal justice context are extremely common. Um, every every U.S. state has one. We've had them for a long time. They gradually expand to include additional categories of offenders. So most of them started out with sort of the worst of the worst, the you know people convicted of homicide or rape, um, and then gradually we added burglars actually tended to be next because people thought of rape as often being a, a crime of opportunity. And it was burglars who broke into a house where someone happened to be home that would be the, you know, most likely to commit a, a rape offense. And then we added more, um, uh, uh, you know, more property crimes and, and less severe crimes. And then at this point, the policy frontier in the United States is states adding arrestees. So if you're arrested for a felony, you'd be added um, or convicted of misdemeanors. So basically just adding um, additional uh, groups that um, you know, are plausibly at, at high risk of, of committing a crime. And then we've you know, collected the crime scene evidence and, and look, for, look for matches. Um, and so the hope is that the technology will reduce crime in two ways. Uh, one, it... Um, so, well, the, the the main mechanism is that this increases the likelihood that you'll get caught for a future offense um, if you weren't already a suspect. If you're already a suspect, then the police can get a warrant for your DNA and compare it to the crime scene evidence themselves. They don't need the database. Um, this is truly in situations where it was, you know, a especially in sort of crimes committed by strangers or, you know, where, where someone wouldn't have been on, on the police radar um, as a suspect. Um, so if you are in that situation, if you're, if you're that offender now, if you, once you're added to the database, you're much more likely to get caught for a future crime than you were before. And, and if you think about the standard Becker model of crime, uh, where we have the, your, a rational offender is deciding whether to commit a crime and they, they consider the likelihood that they'll get caught and the potential punishment that they would receive if they are, and they weigh that against the benefits of, to themselves of committing the crime. Um, if we increase the probability of getting caught, then that should determine per crime. And so, so one, one way these databases could reduce crime is that they deter people who are added to the database from committing more crime. Um, but then in addition, anyone who isn't deterred, who says, yeah, I'm more likely to get caught, but like, who cares? I, you know, this is what I do <laughs> or, or their crimes of passion or whatever else. Um, if it doesn't deter crime, we can at least get those repeat offenders off the streets more quickly. They'll still, they're still more likely to get caught, but we'll incapacitate them um, and make, make places safer. So those are those were the hopes um, as these policies went into effect, um, and so I have studied um, the effects of DNA databases in the United States as well as uh, in a more recent paper in Denmark, where we have much better data. Uh, and in both cases, what we look at is um, the if you think of you know you've got an existing database and suddenly there's a, a, da a database expansion. So on, you know, April 30th, there's, uh, there's the, if you're a, a robbery offender, if you're a robber, you're not going to go in the database, but if you had been charged or convicted on, on May 1st, then, um, then you are going to go in the database and it sets up this nice natural experiment where we can compare people who you know, would have been eligible for the law for uh, their, data, their DNA to be added to the database just before and after the law goes into effect. Um, and what we find in both the U.S. and and in Denmark is that people who are added to the database are dramatically less likely to reoffend. Um, so uh, recidivism falls a lot. Uh, sort of much bigger effects than I ever would have expected going into these projects. Um, and uh, this tells us a lot, I think, both about the power of increasing the probability of getting caught versus increasing the sentence, which has traditionally been U.S. policy um, and, and, and our, the way that we've tried to deter crime, um, but also says a lot about, I think, especially in this context, uh, how much uh, potential offenders think the technology how powerful they think the technology is. And I, I kind of think that there's a bit of a CSI effect going on for, for them. Like they, they think that they're, they're in the database and they will instantly be picked up if they reoffend. Uh, be a helicopter hovering overhead. Yeah. <laughs> right, it doesn't work quite that quickly uh, in reality, but, um, but certainly they don't tell them their chances. Yeah, don't, don't tell anybody. Um, 
Right, exactly. <laughs> as but, long as the technology keeps ad- advancing faster than offenders learn, I think we will we'll be okay. <laughs> so, what are some of the what are some of the downsides of that of those databases? Mm-hmm. The biggest one is is the um, the potential privacy costs or the perceived privacy costs. So, uh, the the information that's actually in the database uh, is is you know, there's just no, there's no sensitive information. It's essentially a string of numbers. You can think of it as a, akin to a social security number. Um, it doesn't really contain any information in and of itself. Um, and the, the, the way that they collect the DNA, is saliva swab. Um, and then they, you know, at this point, it's a very um, mechanical process. They, you know, put it in a machine, it spits out the, the string of numbers that goes in the database. And so, you know, the government is not, uh, is not using, people's genetic material to sort of determine all kinds of health information or your predisposition to schizophrenia or, you know, other things that might even be relevant. Um, but, uh, but people worry about that, right? People do worry about sort of a, sip, a slippery slope. I I do, uh, yeah. And so, so the way I kind of frame um, the results of, of my research in this area is, you know, all of those costs are, you know, are real and people, people are going to perceive them to be what they perceive them as, right? I mean, they're going it's going to differ from person to person how, how much you worry about this. Um, but so at the very least, let's think about what we're getting in exchange for that privacy. Uh, and if you know that, you know, recidivism, I think in Denmark, we find recidivism falls by about 40%. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of tools that are a lot more invasive than this one. And so if you're, if you're okay with having cameras everywhere, <laughs> but not okay with this, I think, you know, I think there's just sort of a scare, uh, a fear factor here that just because it's, it's genetic material. Um, but at the very least, if, if it, it gives you sort of a benchmark to think about, um, you know, if, if, uh, we're saving X dollars every year due to re- a reduced crime, um, and you look at that number and you say, I don't know, it's still not worth it, um, then that just means that your perceived cost in terms of the privacy is higher than that. And that is useful information. Yeah. No, I, it, you know, it's, it's, it opens up a bunch of interesting things. One, of course, is to take the DNA swab and throw it away. But, you know, tell the person that's, of course, dishonest and would be a bad policy to think <laughs> in a democracy. But it might be a lot better than storing genetic material on people or background issues. Um, you know, if you watch the movie Gattaca, which I recommend, it's a fantastic film. Mm-hmm. It's about the awareness of how inevitably you leave genetic material around. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think, yes. I think it's somewhat true, whether it's a, a strand of hair or a fleck of skin or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's great because, hey, we're going to get them. And it's horrible yep. because it means there's a level of potential control by the state that's uh, – that's not healthy. Um, so, but yeah, but I mean, I think the, um, in some ways, I think one of the benefits of this technology is spreading the, uh, the, the, the risk of, of wrongful conviction. If they're, you know, if, if you want to think about this that way to a broader group, um, I think it's healthy that we are all thinking now about like, well, what if I get caught up in the DNA database? Like what, like, you know, and, and right now, like the, again, this, the, the comparison is not sort of some ideal system where we know the truth. The, the, the comparison should be the status quo where, where police officers make, uh, you know, wrongful arrest the wrong guy all the time, yeah. and um, and I think if this moves us, and so you know, there there are uh, extremely high privacy costs for certain communities in this country who are targeted and and sort of the usual suspects for police, and and um, and this I think these advances where you've got scientific matches uh, should make most of the arrests more accurate. And in cases where you've got, you know, you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so they found your DNA there. Um, or there's, you know, act, there's, there's certainly human error, active um, human uh, malfeasance <laughs> that is occasionally reported on in these, in these crime labs. Um, you know, we, the rest of us could, uh, could get caught up in that sometimes, but I think, I think it is, that's actually a, uh, that's useful somewhat to making us think about the problems that others have already been dealing with. But it also can, as you say, it can also prove someone's innocence, which is yeah. which is wonderful and glorious. Absolutely. Does it? Uh, 
besides errors like coding errors and all, there's all there's human imperfection obviously in entering the mm-hmm. database and so on. Are there any strange things? I remember a story about a cousin getting tangled up in something because they shared DNA with somebody. Is that am I remembering that mm-hmm. correctly? So I don't know about the specific story, but I know that um, uh, one of the more controversial policies that states can implement is allowing familial uh, DNA searches, where they basically look for partial matches that could lead them to the family member of someone who's yeah. in a, who's in the database. That's probably what I'm thinking of. Yeah. And so, so you can imagine, I mean, it, it essentially expands the database to be not just people who have been convicted or arrested in the past, but basically everyone in their family, um, uh, which I mean, still, I mean, you, you have to then demonstrate that, uh, the person was actually, you know, there and committed the crime and the DNA, the partial match is certainly not going to solve a case. Um, what's really interesting to me in this space right now is all of the, um, uh, the recent stories about how they, they, they caught that serial rapist and murder in California by um, uploading, D- like citizens uploaded, uh, maybe the police departments were involved, uploaded D- the DNA samples to um, a private um, uh, DNA database for used for um, genealogy. Um, and so, and a lot of these, you know, 23andMe and those types of databases don't allow um, you to kind of upload your own string of numbers. You have to actually send them the DNA sample, which the police would not have, but some do, some databases do. And suddenly, so they caught, they caught that one offender that had been a cold case for a long time. And then other police departments were like, whoa, that's a great idea. <laughs> and so other police departments are now doing this. Um, and it's just been fascinating to think about, like, I mean, I, I suspect most of these databases will start uh, ending, you know, change their privacy practices to to not allow this. Because I imagine most people who um, they're going to stop paying for the service if they know <laughs> that they could be um, pulled into investigations. But but it is really interesting to just think about, like, you know, if you if you don't perceive this as having big privacy costs, if we if we have an, all the safeguards in place that you need um, to make sure that you know they're not coding other stuff from your your genome and, and sensitive information, and we have or you know if you trust the process more in terms of it not you know they they have to there's a high burden of proof to show that you actually did it and all of that stuff. Um, what an incredibly cheap way to catch offenders and reduce crime. You know, it's just like, this is just one of those advances that is both terrifying, but also really exciting. Um, because this is just so, if like, if this, if this type of tool can dramatically reduce criminal offending, it is surely a whole lot less, uh, well, I, I, I suppose it is somewhat controversial, but I, I think it is a lot less, um, uh, uh, socially costly than putting lots of people in prison for decades on end. Yeah, I'm going to put on my left wing hat, which I have <laughs> to reach. It's not readily available, but I think I can find it here in my <laughs> office. And I'm going to just mention, I think, a, another cost of this kind of improvement or solution, which is it diverts us from thinking about the underlying reasons that people cr- cause commit crimes and and have miserable lives and um, do irreparable harm to people around them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think for most uh, wealthy, successful, unprisoned people like me, it's tempting to say, well, all we care about is just, you know, catching criminals. But we don't mm-hmm. really. What we really care about is, I hope, is creating an opportunity for human beings to flourish And Mm -hmm. this kind of solves that problem in a way too late way that is seductive. So that's my that's my worry. Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah. If we think of um, crime as, you know, it it is a social it it is a costly outcome in itself, but it is also a proxy for other things that are going wrong in someone's life. Um, And so if you think of it as more of like a symptom (laughs) than a than a. uh, an end goal, then then you're totally right. So a lot, a lot of my work right now is I've been doing all this tech and crime stuff, but uh, wrote a paper a couple of years ago on ban the box policies, uh, which we can talk more about if, if you'd explain, like. But explain it, what that is. Sure. So um, so ban the box is a, a 
policy has become really popular in the United States um, to try to improve um, the access to employment for people who have criminal records. Uh, and the idea behind it, the motivation for it, is that we know that employers discriminate against people with criminal records. Um, so uh, the, the name of the policy comes from this idea that there's a box that you're asked to check if you've ever been convicted of a crime. Crime, uh, and that employers would just sort of like throw out the applications from that have the box checked. And so um, a lot of very well-meaning people said, well, we can solve this problem by just banning the box. Um, we'll just tell employers they can't ask anymore. Uh, and then as you uh, you noted earlier, the, the, um, the question that economists love to ask is, and then what? Uh, and the uh, it turns out that's really important here because the policy doesn't do anything to change, to address why employers were worried about hiring people with criminal records. And so um, it turns out that when they are not allowed to ask anymore, they try to guess and then they reduce their hiring of black men. Um, and so you see a net reduction uh, for a young black men who don't have a college degree, the group that's sort of most likely to be helped by this policy if it's helpful, but also the most likely to be statistically discriminated against uh, if employers are then just trying to guess who has a criminal record, um, their employment rates fall by 5% um, in the years after Ban the Box goes into effect. Um, so a great example of unintended consequences consequences of well-meaning policies. Um, and so you sort of in the process of writing that paper and, and in the years since I've, I've become very interested in prisoner reentry and like, what, what do we know about what would be better than this? Right. Um, cause I think I always try to, um, ultimately like I, I do research because I, I care about making policy better and, and, um, trying to, to achieve the outcomes that these policies had, had in mind. And want to be able to recommend alternatives to ban the box for people who act re like really just want to help people with criminal records build better lives. Um, and unfortunately, we just know so little about how to do this well. Um, so that is uh, that is sort of another area where it just it's, um, I think, uh, you know, to the extent that, as, as you said, we want to we want to help people kind of have opportunities and 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 build better lives so that they don't need to be involved in crime or don't wind up down, going down that path, but also so they can get out of it if they want to change their lives um, and figuring out ways to kind of help that process along and make the opportunities available to people who want to seize them, I think is um, something that we don't, we just don't know much about yet as, as researchers. Yeah. I'm going to come back to this parallel, which is just haunting me in our conversation, which mm -hmm. between education and, and crime, mm -hmm. um, you know, you say we don't know much about it. I'd say we don't know much about what makes a good school teacher in the sense that it's not easily quantified, like have a master's degree. That's not mm -hmm. an important part of being a good teacher. Sure. Um, and and so as researchers, we inevitably look where the light is, uh, mm -hmm. like the drunk stumbling around looking for keys under the lamppost mm -hmm. when they were lost further from the scene. And so we're always looking for measurable, quantifiable things that can end with regression when, in fact, I think we ought to be looking at um, videos and intangibles and subtle things and enhancing the opportunities for people who, who we know are good at, even though we can't explicitly measure why, and mm -hmm. and getting the people who aren't good at it out. So, so mm -hmm. for example, uh, you know, it seems to me this is an example where you want 500 or 500,000 nonprofits – funded by voluntary contributions to help transform people's lives out after prison, most of them will mm -hmm. not be good at it. <laughs> that, yeah. But there'll be a handful that 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 we that are good at it. And we want to scale those mm -hmm. up and we want to and again I'd get the government out of this for a lot of reasons. But one reason mm -hmm. would be is that they're not going to be able to discriminate in any way. They're just going to have to fund they're not going to be able to make the judgment call the way the head of a, a really first rate nonprofit could of uh, mm -hmm. who's doing a good job and who isn't. They're going to need measurable things. We're back to square one again. So it just yeah. strikes me that, uh, again, just like I think people are doing really fabulous things, trying to figure out the subtle things that people do to become better teachers, the subtle things we can do to train people after prison to have better lives is not going to be a scientific enterprise. It's going to be an artful enterprise, and we ought to let a thousand mm -hmm. flowers bloom and let the good ones thrive. So I, uh, I'm with you in, in spirit to a certain extent. I think the challenge is that we know that 
that well-meaning policies have on it and programs have backfire all the time, yep. right? Like un there are unintended consequences all the time. So there's actually, so a great example of this in the reentry space is um, a real emphasis recently on holistic or wraparound services. So the idea is that people coming out of prison um, have just a tremendous number of needs. They have generally have, they have higher rates of substance abuse, um, mental illness, low education, no yeah. work history, you know, on and on and on, no, nowhere to live. Um, and so what we should yeah, you know, full core press. So we give people, um, you know, just in, intensive case management. They have a, you know, someone that they can go to 24 hours a day and who will help connect with them with all the services they need. Uh, and the best, so then the, these program, these types of programs are typically so highly praised in communities across the country. This, they're fairly, um, so this is probably the most common type of intervention. Um, and, uh, and then it turns out when you actually do a randomized control trial of them, they don't have any benefits. And in fact, it's so th thinking of like your example of just give funding to local communities to kind of do whatever needs to be done there. there it, the, the funding was coming from the government, which you might not like, but they, basically the idea was um, in recent years, the government has poured a ton of money just into the, just like find nonprofits that do especially, that really focus on especially these, these more holistic type of treatments. It wasn't just job training or something like that. Um, but just like gave them money and said, just keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, uh, but again, it was implemented as an RCT so that we could see what, um, you know, what the impacts were in these local communities. Um, and uh, on average, people who were in the treatment group who got access to the services and these programs that got all the money uh, were more likely to wind up with another conviction down the road, not less. And so it it's just, it just, it, I think just highlights how hard this is, right? Yeah. I mean, so there's, of course, you're... Um, you're trying to address needs and trying to, to do good things, but there's also the potential that by kind of that the full port, court press itself could actually do more harm than good in the sense of, you know, maybe it just takes up a whole lot of the person's time that they could have been spending some other, you know, looking for a job or something. Alternatively, it could be, there could be something about, um, you know, holding someone's hand through all of these different assets, uh, facets of their lives that kind of reduces their own sense of agency yep. and that a more targeted intervention, you know, just cognitive behavioral therapy and then like leave it at that or something like that. Um, just a more targeted intervention could give the person the freedom to, to kind of rack up wins on their own without help. And that, that could be just incredibly beneficial. And so this is something where I think um, it, it just, we, you know, some things are not going to be measured. Some things it's just going to be really hard to, we'll never have all the answers, but, but I do, I do believe in the power of, of good research to, to be able to, um, to point us in the right direction better than sort of our guts are able to do. I agree with that hundred percent in particular, um, you know, while you're saying what you're saying, I was thinking, what, yeah, but agency, what about this feeling yeah. that, that, <laughs> that if someone's constantly hovering over you? So I, again, there's an mm -hmm. artful way to do it. And, your other point, which I think is crucial, is it's really hard to do. And yeah. so I would expect the null, the the modal impact to be zero. Absolutely. Uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't five or 10 or maybe even 20 percent of the people who are helping others who do it really well. Mm -hmm. And we they yeah. get lost in the noise because it's hard yeah. to measure and uh, or they yeah. get a bad, even though it's random. They just happen to draw particularly difficult people, so it's not really random. It just only looks – the process is random, but the actual outcomes are, that they're dealing with are not. And so I, yeah, I, I, yeah. Just, I just think I, – anyway, well said. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you, and I, I think um, you know when I go around and talk to policymakers about this, my last slide is always uh, – we should assume everything we try will fail. <laughs> and, and this is not coming from a, a place of pessimism. I think it's fundamental. I think of, I think of myself as a very optimistic person uh, uh, and uh, in the sense that I think that there are answers out there. Like I think, I think we will figure out what works, but we're slowing ourselves down by not, by, by sort of um, becoming in invested in certain programs before we know that they're working. And uh, the best the best way to figure out quickly 
what's going to have the biggest impact is to just implement, implement things, try new things, do it in a way that allows us to test what the impact is. And then and as soon as we figure out it's not working, move on, try something else, right? But if we, if we go in with the expectation of failure, then we're much less likely to wind up in a situation that I see all the time in, in government agencies who care deeply about this, but they have like a pet program that has been running for years and they just, they don't want to know if it, if it doesn't work, frankly, because like they believe in it so strongly. And that's just, that is just so detrimental to sort of this, this uh, to, to figuring out what can be beneficial. And just to make one last, at least for now, analogy to education, I think there's a terribly mistaken belief that we need to figure out what is the solution to education, what's the right way, what's the, the correct curriculum. And it comes back to the, in a way, to the Norway example you, you said about Norway training in prison and, mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, that's the solution. That's what we need to right. do. Let's take everything <laughs> they do. We'll just do it here. When in fact, yeah. the real solution is going to be multivariate, manifoldly different, uh, depending on the individual, depending on the location, the neighborhood, et cetera. And there's, that's the artfulness part. And we need 10 different solutions, not, not one. And we yes. ought to be ready for that. Um, yeah. Let's close with some bigger picture issues. Um, you're an economist. Uh, mm -hmm. Economists have been studying crime, uh, I think, probably since Gary Becker now, which is about mm -hmm. 50 years, which is pretty amazing. And when Becker came into the field, he was ridiculed by sociologists and others who said people, criminals aren't rational by definition. And his response, of course, was uh, it's useful to treat them as if they are. And mm -hmm. incentives matter even for criminals. And, of course, your work is in many ways – not in many ways. Your work is in that tradition. And sure. I'm curious what you think the challenges are facing economists in interacting with a policy space that has lots of non-economists who don't mm -hmm. really uh, – who don't always respect what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, great What's question. What's your personal um, experience on that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, – uh, it, you're right that, um, economists don't view the world the same way as non-economists do <laughs> for better or worse. Yeah. Um, so I, when people ask me like why, uh, you know, how an economist would wind up studying crime, I, you know, my first answer is we're interested in incentives and this, and, and incentives are relevant here too. Um, not just for, you know, rational offenders, but also police officers and judges and all the rest. Um, but we're also really focused on weighing costs and benefits. And in order to do that, we are much more focused than I think any other social science discipline on identifying the causal effect of a policy. You have to know you've nailed down what the impact of the program is in order to calculate what the benefits of the program are. And so we just have developed as, as a field, as a discipline, a, a toolkit that, um, that allows us to focus on that, on measuring that causal effect. Um, and so that distinguishes us from, from researchers in other disciplines. And, uh, and I think, you know, we, we have discussions within, within economics ourselves about the extent to which our focus on, on causal identification distracts us from the important questions. And, and those are useful discussions to have, but for, you know, I think, I, I do think measuring, measuring the causal impact is important. Um, and that is definitely one of our big contributions. Um, I think in the crime space, the, the pushback, I, I, it most often tends to be around, um, how you can possibly place a value on say a human life, right? So how could you possibly, uh, clearly the, um, if we're thinking about whether some crime reduction policy could reduce the homicide rate, some people will say, well, then we obviously have to do it no matter if, if we save even one life, it's worth, it's worth it. Uh, and I think economists just come at this because we are used to thinking about trade-offs and thinking in terms of sort of, of you know, quantifiable numbers um, can, can, can react or will react, I think, for the most part to that sort of reasoning and say like, well, the way we're all living our lives suggests that we don't place infinite value on other people's lives, right? I mean, we're all, we drive cars. <laughs> we, uh, you know, just we do things all day long that might potentially yeah. have negative impacts. And and so obviously we're weighing trade-offs and, and we we place some like non-infinite value on, on these things. So 
Um, so, but in order to, to weigh those trade-offs, we have to, we have to put numbers on them. It's just sort of the, uh, it's the nature of the game. Um, I have other work on, um, on opioids and have kind of gotten dipped my toe into that debate, uh, a couple of times now, uh, looking at the unintended consequences of, of policies that reduce the risk associated with using opioids and that debate, uh, so then I wind up um, interacting with the public health uh, research community and they also, I think, have a really hard time um, uh, with the way economists approach things. And so that I have not figured out how to how to have productive <laughs> discussions with that group, unfortunately. Um, I think there's just a lot of talking past each other about, um, you know, what what economists are bringing to the table and, and the value of caus- causal inference and the value of... Um, and just the possibility of trade-offs. I mean, I think economists are much more used to thinking about trade-offs than most other disciplines are and, and comfortable with it. Like no policy is all benefits, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. We just have to, if we know what the costs are, maybe we can mitigate those costs and that's useful. Um, and I think uh, a lot of my interactions with, with folks in the public health space suggest that they view any cost or potential trade-off as a threat to the possibility that the program will happen. Um, and I think that's, Unfortunate. Yeah. Um, that's the so, something. Yeah. That's the something better than nothing uh, impulse. Yeah. I think we all have, which is a human impulse, and I think economists are are fairly well inoculated against that because we're trained relentlessly in unintended consequences, which is a beautiful thing, and sometimes mm-hmm. um, uh, very difficult, for, as you say, for other disciplines and other people to to listen to. They don't want to hear either. They don't want to hear it, or they think we're just wrong. Right. One of the challenges, <laughs> which well, maybe we are. I right. mean, well, one of the challenges, ultimately, a lot of all these questions are uh, most of these questions are empirical questions, and then you can take it to the data. I think one thing I love about being an economist is I think that uh, as a group, we we rarely let each other coast on our priors, right? Like almost no hypothesis is off, is off limits in an economic seminar room, and and you can disagree with um, you can think that the person asking the question is dead wrong and their hypothesis is crazy, but you need to be able to show in the data um, or in your, in your model or something. You, you need some evidence that, um, that they're crazy. You can't just call them a bad person and that's not going to end the argument. Um, and so for better or worse, I think economists are, are used to being called bad people <laughs> and, and it's not persuasive to us. So I, I think that makes our, our research better. But I think before we were started recording our conversation, you and I talked about the, uh, I would call it the, uh, one of the costs of being economists or costs of acquiring this uh, inoculation and, and, and our natural tendency to worry about unintended consequences, which is we can fall in love with contrarian results, results that, that show that the public health profession's priors are wrong. I mean, just take a famous example, you know, Sam Peltzman is not so popular in some circles because he showed that many safety measures encourage people to drive more recklessly, say, or to behave mm-hmm. more recklessly. And I think he's right. I think he's onto something. I think the mm-hmm. – and when people say, well, but people don't take those into account, I just ask them, you know, if football players didn't wear helmets, do you think they'd play the same way? And the answer is right. they would not. But that doesn't mean that every football player, when they make a play, is thinking, well, at least I have a helmet on. You know, and mm-hmm. tragically, we've been forced to come to grips with this – very uh, unpleasant, unintended consequence of safer helmets. They've led to mm-hmm. less safe play, and it looks like terrible damage to some people. Um, but we, if we're not careful, we fall in love with that. And and mm-hmm. those are the things, those unexpected results, those contrarian results, those unintended consequence results, we're a little bit over, not a little bit, I think we're over enamored of them, and it tends to push us toward research findings that are more publishable and cleverer and maybe not always true. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I do think that there's, there's, Val- there's a reason we're enamored with them, right? I mean, this is the unique perspective that economists brings to the yeah. table. And to the extent that like, you know, if you just want to focus on good program evaluation, there are plenty of people who can do that. <laughs> and so, but the fact that it's going to be economists who are going to say, oh, well, if you make it safer to do that, people will probably do more of it. I wonder if I can measure that. Um, I think you're right that that is the sort of um, the sort of natural experiment, the sort of uh, analysis that economists just just love. Like we just we just like it puts a smile on our faces <laughs> um, to hear about that sort of thing. But I, 
but that's partly because it it's it reveals something about human behavior that wouldn't be revealed otherwise. And in many cases, it's important, right? And I think one thing I've sort of learned to do is just to highlight up front that recognizing these unintended consequences doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do the we shouldn't implement the policy, right? We just need to recognize that there are trade-offs and and knowing what the trade-offs are, having a full understanding of all the costs and benefits in a situation allows us to implement other policies that maybe can help mitigate those those costs um, or find a better policy that doesn't have the costs, right? I think if we just sort of settle for the first thing that seems to work, regardless of all the downsides, we're missing out on opportunities of, of doing even better things. And so, yeah, I mean, I think economists economists are always bringing the bad news to the conversation, but I think, I hope, I mean, the reason I'm an economist is I think it ultimately leads us, uh, leads us to a better place. I'll play public health um, <laughs> researcher for a minute and, and mm-hmm. point out that I, I think we have a flaw as economists to assume that, oh, we'll save this money because it'll be spent more wisely elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and you could argue that the public health people really have the right view, which is that money's not going to be spent at all in this area that the public reacts to certain research findings with in non-rational, irrational ways, and we're better off at least with some money going there. And so I think that's the I think that's the downside of our uh, engineering um, uh, focus that we'll just reallocate the money more efficiently, and because it often doesn't happen. So it, it, it's that's yeah. Relevant. I mean, so but I, I do so I do hear that from public health folks a lot, and I but when I talk with actual policy makers and practitioners who are on the ground trying to figure out what to do about a certain policy or, um, you know, how much to invest, they are very thoughtful about this. Like my, my sense is that none of them are saying, okay, end all the safe injection sites or something, <laughs> you know, like they're not just, uh, no one's behaving that rashly. I, I think people who are actually on the ground making these sorts of decisions are pretty, are very aware that they're, they're trade-offs. Like they are the ones who have to balance their budget every year, right? So they're, they're fully aware of this stuff. Um, and I, I think we should I think we should just give people more credit for being able to kind of handle complexity. Um, and 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 you're right that you know a lot of this is kind of a voters and and um, all kinds of people respond to to things without full knowledge. But um, but I do think that we're we're capable of of having more complex conversations than we often give ourselves credit for. It was very well said. Safe injection sites is a reference to the uh, so then the the I've been recently wrote a um, a Brookings blog post kind of reviewing recent research from mostly mostly economists, not all economists, um, about what to do about the opioid crisis, and uh, we got a lot of pushback on our review of the evidence of harm reduction policies, um, mostly around these these moral hazard concerns that Sam Peltzman made so famous, um, and and safe injection sites and syringe exchange are, are um, in that category where yeah. you could imagine them having huge benefits on net but coming with the unintended consequence of, of leading to more drug use because it's safer. Um, and so thinking about that trade-off and, and just kind of what we could do to try to mitigate that, um, I think is, is really important. I want to close with one other um, thing I worry about, which is that, I mean, I think you're a, a very careful um, scholar. You're working in an area that's extremely uh, important. It's an area where people's lives are, going to be affected by what you find, but you're a human being and you're you're obviously going to be drawn, <laughs> you're going to be drawn to the contrarian result when you see it. Mm-hmm. And and one of the challenges I know we have in our profession is that, you know, when you go out to quote measure, measure the impact of policy X, which is a phrase that makes it sound like you've got a, a ruler or a, um, <laughs> a calorimeter or some kind of measuring device. But in fact, what we do in our field is we run maybe 500 or 5,000 regressions and we Mm -hmm. econometric analyses and we figure out what we convince ourselves as to what the right one is. So reflect a little on the humility that should engender. And I'm curious if, if you worry about that is your career advances and, and the incentives that you face for dramatic findings as, as much as accurate ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, so it's definitely something I think about. I, so I um, spend a lot of time with, uh, with 
academic psychologists um, who have been dealing with the replication crisis there. And it, it seems like the yeah, um, we've talked about it a lot on the program. Had Brian Nesek yeah, on twice, and yeah, and so they, um, you know, I think the the conclusion in that in that field has been to really go all in on things like pre-analysis plans and and pre-registering uh, experiments and so on. And I think there's now, I just saw that AER, I think, now requires that you pre-register any RCT that you're going American to run. American Economic Review. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of our main or one of our one of our top five journals. Uh, if you want to publish your randomized control trial in their journal, then they're gonna you you better have registered it up front before you ran it. Um, I actually really like so you know I, I also hear plenty about in psych how people are gaming that system and just running a zillion pilots before they <laughs> figure out the one that works and then they're gonna huh. that's when they <laughs> register it right uh, like yeah I mean people you could figure out ways to game it. I actually really like that economists have gotten to the point where we're the standard um, empirical paper now is like, you know, 30 pages of text and like a hundred page appendix <laughs> with every robustness check under the sun. And, uh, and I think that that, I think the idea that, um, that in our, especially observational data analyses where you're not running an experiment, uh, you're dealing with, you have a natural experiment you're trying to evaluate. You're learning so much along the way that the idea that like your, your first, your first regression is somehow going to be the best one or the right one or the most un, you know, uncontaminated or something just strikes me as, uh, it just not, not informed by how much learning is involved in these, in the, in this process of this. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, what we've what we've come to do as a profession is expect for every judgment call you make, you better show me in the appendix, you know, a table where you do it every other way so that I can see that like you didn't just choose the outlier, right? Or like what happens if you drop one state at a time or you like choose different thresholds or all these different things. And and so especially, in, I mean, ultimately this is a profession where um, we have to trust one another, Um and and our reputations are everything, and so I think the the risk involved for someone like me or like anyone who's in actively you know publishing academic papers, there's such a tremendous risk in like if you if you get a reputation as being someone who's like cherry picking results or um, uh, or just is not is is not being sort of transparently more scientific about the process, uh, people aren't going to trust you anymore. And that's, that defeats the whole point of, of doing this. And so I do think that ultimately, um, there's not going to be an easy policy fix for this. <laughs> this is something where we're, trust is just going to be a big component of it. Um, and the best researchers are really careful and, and also, you know, the, the, ultimately every paper contributes to a literature and, and then we interpret the literature as a whole instead of just looking at, at a single paper. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a not a super, not a super direct, uh, easy answer, but that's my that's how I think about this issue. My guest today has been Jennifer Darliak. Jennifer, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much. This was fun. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.